Hello and thank you so much for joining us for the video series titled Teaching and Learning Evidence-Based Relationships, Interviews with the Experts. This project is brought to you by the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy, APA Division 29, and is a companion project to the third edition of Psychotherapy Relationships that Work. The overall goal of the project is to translate relationship research to teaching and learning from the classroom context to clinical supervision. My name is Dr. Raina Markin, and today we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Clara Hill, Professor of Psychology at the University of Maryland College Park. And the topic of today's discussion is how to translate research on self-disclosure and immediacy to teaching and training. Thank you for joining us, Clara. Thank you, Raina. It's terrific to talk to you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the first question is just, can you start off by defining self-disclosure and immediacy, sort of how you operationalize it in your research, um, sure. how you distinguish between the two? Sure. So self-disclosure is something that the therapist says about themselves, um, mostly outside of therapy. So it's not related to the, what's going on inside of therapy. It's related to something historical or something about themselves that's personal. In contrast, immediacy is a discussion of the therapeutic relationship. So it's often called processing the therapeutic relationship or talking about the relationship in the here and now. And initially, early on in the research, they were combined. So people would talk about therapist disclosure and immediacy together. But in fact, they're very different um, because one's outside, kind of looking at self outside, but the other is about what's going on between the two people in the therapy session. And it's not just the therapist saying, I feel about you, but it could be asking the client how they feel. It could be talking about what's going on. So it, it's become more than just the therapist saying how they feel about the client. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, but I think training students on how to use self-disclosure and immediacy are also very different. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you briefly describe uh, your main findings in this new meta-analysis that you and your collaborators did? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I have to put a caveat here that there weren't many studies. These studies are incredibly hard to do because the only studies we looked at were studies involving disclosure or immediacy used in a session. So we looked at the immediate effects of those interventions. Mm -hmm. Though there were only 21 studies. Mm -hmm. um, and then breaking that down even more, there were only five studies that focused on disclosure and six on immediacy in a way that we could somewhat compare them. So we're going with very few studies here, again, because it's so hard to do. Um, but the, the two interventions had very different impacts. When you looked at self-disclosure, the impacts were mostly supportive. It built a better therapeutic relationship. It helped the client feel better about themselves. Um, so it, what we called kind of, there were very supportive interventions. The therapist tended to use disclosure to make the client feel like they weren't the only ones having the feelings they had, but there was some universality to what they were going through. Um, and to feel like there were the power balance in the relationship was maybe a little bit um, better. Okay, so they're very supportive interventions and also very brief usually. So the therapist would say something, the client tended not to respond because the therapist tended to shift the focus back to the client pretty quickly, like, how do you feel about what I said? In contrast, the effects of the of immediacy were to get the client to open up and to get the client to be immediate. So tends to be that immediacy is used to help negotiate the relationship, what's going to happen. It tends to be used to maintain the relationship, to make sure that everything is going okay, or to resolve ruptures in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it tends to be a lot longer. So a lot of the time you might, you start a process and the process might, might go 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour. Um, but talking about the process, that what's going on in the relationship is very intense often mm -hmm. and often takes a lot of energy. Uh -huh. Somebody said the phrase, the temperature in the room goes up 15 degrees as soon uh -huh. as you're talking about what's going on between two people. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and so, I mean, I guess given your findings, how do you suggest uh, approaching students in your training of self-disclosure and immediacy, you know, how to attend to these aspects of the relationship, how to be competent in using these right. skills? Right. So first of all, it's really important to do with novice therapists, basic skills training. And um, 
as you recall, I have a three-stage model uh, where we start with exploration. You start with the simpler, more basic skills of reflection of feelings, restatement. You get the person thinking about those, practicing a lot with volunteer clients, um, and working over and over to figure out when to do them, what to do them, how to look at the effects. And then only after they've mastered the exploration skills, then you move to the insight skills, which are more of the so disclosure and immediacy. And again, you practice a lot. You have clients who are talking about their personal issues so that the therapists have real clients to work with, volunteer but real. Um, and you practice over and over until they get a sense of when to do it, how to do it, what the effects are. And they also serve as clients, as volunteer clients, so they can experience the effects on themselves. Mm -hmm. So the basic skills training is really important to set the foundation. Mm -hmm. And then once you start actually seeing real clients, what's really important is supervision to figure out when, when you've done a disclosure, or an immediacy to look at the effects of that. Mm -hmm. what, why did you do it? What were the effects? What could you have done differently? Um, and to then practice how you could do it differently over and over and over, kind of the deliberate practice idea mm -hmm. of practicing that specific skill with that particular client over and over. Mm -hmm. And then um, perhaps even more importantly, besides the basic skills and the supervision is personal therapy. Yeah. Because one of the things, and you'll ask a question about this later, but one of the things that really comes up very often with disclosure and immediacy is a lot of personal issues, sometimes wanting to solve your own problems by shifting the balance, like, oh, you think you had it bad, let me tell you about me. <laughs> um, and that's just really important for the therapist to be in therapy so that they understand where those things are coming from and, and try to resolve their own problems outside so that they can then be available for the client. Yeah, no, I, I do remember as a graduate student, the, the model being very helpful so, right. um, to operationalize the different skills and just make it very concrete. Um, exactly. Jumping in exactly. The murky waters of seeing actual clients. Right. Um, yeah, that feeling of building confidence. Yes. And knowing, okay, here's, here's a disclosure, I can do it. Now figuring out when do I do it? And how do I do it? Yes. Exactly. And, and why are you doing it? in the moment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's so crucial. Are you doing it for your own needs or are you doing it for the client needs? And if you're doing it for your own needs, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. I think for in my role as a as a instructor um, or a supervisor what is challenging is that I think with self dis having the students understand that the impact of self disclosure because I think students come in with this perception that self-disclosure is always going to be positive impact on the on the client, mm -hmm. um, whereas you know the moment you self-disclose that that changes the frame of things, changes the dynamics, and and you can't go back. <laughs> from right. That. Right. So have, right. Helping you know the students understand how the, their role is so different as a right. counselor than it is as a friend, and that there are. A variety of different impacts that self-disclosure, even a seemingly innocuous self-disclosure, can have on the client. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's so important to, to understand. And now some clients, some therapists come in thinking they should never self-disclose. Yeah. You know, they come from other backgrounds where they've heard never just, you know, you just never disclose. And so to tell them it's <laughs> at some place in between never disclose and always disclose. It's yes. well, <laughs> when do you do it? Yeah. And when is it okay to break those boundaries and yeah. shift the relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the, the other thing, Raina, I just want to comment is, sure. you know, when we talk about even, I gave you a definition of disclosure and immediacy, but that also covers a lot of things. Like you could disclose about feelings. Like when I was in your situation, I felt angry. Mm -hmm. You could disclose about similarities. I have been in a similar situation myself. You could disclose about insight that you gained, mm -hmm. or you could disclose about actions that you've taken. Those, mm -hmm. And those have very different impacts. Mm -hmm. We didn't get that we didn't have enough data to look at those, but, but again, they have very different impacts. To say somebody, you know, I, I brush my teeth twice a day has a very different impact than, you know, when my parents got divorced, I didn't handle it very well. Right. So maybe that's one direction to go in the future to sort of more examine the impacts of these different types of- Absolutely, stuff. absolutely. The other thing I should mention <laughs> is that these are very infrequent 
interventions. Mm -hmm. So um, in one study, they were used 1% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, some studies use more, but, um, but it's really important that in some ways they may be impactful because they're used so seldom. It could be that they're, they're, it's almost like a gift. You know, when the therapist usually doesn't talk about themselves, and then this one time they offer a disclosure, the client really usually pays attention. Uh -huh. So it has a bigger impact. And did you sometimes, in, in any of these studies, is, did you find that after the, the counselor uses self-disclosure that that is often followed by immediacy, that they sort of go hand in hand, or did it not? That, that makes sense, especially yeah. if the therapist says, how did you feel about it? Yeah. But we haven't been able to, yeah. you know, th again, there's so few studies, we haven't been able right. to look at that, but it's a great question. Yeah, so many ways to go in the future. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so are there any readings or videos that you recommend using either in the classroom or in supervision? Yeah, well, the readings, I know, not surprisingly, I'm going to recommend my book on helping skills. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> Um, also, there's a chapter we did on training and supervision in the Handbook of Psychotherapy and Behavior Change, which I think is a good overview of training in general. Uh -huh. And then there's a series of studies we did looking at how to train clients, uh, therapists to use challenges, interpretations, and immediacy. And that's particularly beneficial. And the, the key finding from that series of studies is that instruction is helpful. It's nice. Modeling is helpful. Yeah. Feedback is helpful, but what's really helpful is practice. Practice, yeah. So the, the basic message there is you really need to practice in a multitude of ways with volunteer clients, with handwritten things, watching videos, uh -huh. all kinds of ways to practice, but practice, practice, practice to get better. Cli uh, therapists usually say when they first start learning helping skills and read it, they say, oh, this sounds so easy. Oh, right. <laughs> and then they try it and it's really very difficult. Um, yeah, it's always easy on paper, I guess. <laughs> I mean, do you have any, you obviously have a lot of experience with this. I mean, do you have any suggestions for, you know, educators about, you know, how to best use this practice, right? So if I have students do role plays using self-disclosure and immediacy, well, then after the role play, you know, what can I do to make that experience most helpful for them? Right. So I think a lot of it is reflectivity. In other words, reflecting back on what happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did that. How did, how did it feel? Mm -hmm. What were the impacts? How, and asking the client, that's a really the benefit of having volunteer clients who are classmates often, uh -huh. because they can tell you how it felt. And also then when you are a recipient, when you're a volunteer client, you know how it felt, the different ways of doing it. So that reflecting on it, I think, is really important, both in the basic skills and in supervision, mm -hmm. to look back and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and just recently at a conference, people were talking a lot about the idea of why aren't experienced therapists maybe better? And the idea was a lot of times they don't take the time to reflect, to think back. Okay, I did a disclosure. How did that work? Mm -hmm. Asking the client, how did that work? And really spending a lot of time reflecting. So I think reflecting is important and also feedback. Mm -hmm. So feedback, the idea of, of a trainer being there and saying, well, you could try it this way, try that way. Let's practice it a little bit more. Let's role play again and try it again. So the, the practice, feedback, and reflectivity, I think, are all crucial elements for learning the skill and for being able to do it in a session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the most common challenges that you encounter when training students on how to attend to self disclosure yeah. and immediacy? And then I guess importantly, how do you recommend remedying or approaching these problems, these challenges? Yeah. Well, one of the one of the challenges that we, we kind of linked on is the idea that very often uh, therapists their own issues get triggered, yeah. right? When they're talking to clients. One of the wonderful things about clients is, you know, you, 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 get, you do start thinking a lot about your own issues, but sometimes your own issues become so paramount that you can't block them out. And so sometimes the disclosure or immediacy is because of counter-transference and because you're just so triggered, you don't know what to do. And so that's a huge, huge problem. And 
before going to other problems, I mean, the whole notion of personal therapy, again, uh, can't emphasize enough how figuring out your counter-transference, figuring out what issues of your own are triggered and, and what's going on there and, and going back and looking at those yourself in your own therapy, just crucial. Um, a second one is the whole notion that you talked about, about how different it is from, from friendship. So, you know, when we're with friends, we're supposed to disclose half and half. Mm -hmm. You know, we give a lot of advice, we disclose, we're, we're on an equal level. Whereas with therapy, even the most humanistic therapists, they don't disclose as much as the client does. The, you're there for the client. Mm -hmm. And of course we grow as therapists, but your goal is the client is paramount. Mm -hmm. So shifting from 50% disclosure, giving advice to um, maybe 1%, 5% is really difficult. It's, it's, it's just a whole shift of framework. And so beginning therapists particularly it doesn't feel comfortable. They, they, they don't feel comfortable doing it or not doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that's a big one. Um, also, being able to read client reactions. Mm -hmm. Some people are very super attuned to what's going on with the client. Other people are not as aware and have to almost be trained in becoming emotionally intelligent to, to see what's going on with the client. And if they can't see it, to figure out how to ask about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, 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 kind of my remedies are kind of things I've already talked about, the personal therapy, yeah. supervision being really crucial. Um, and then just on, on one's own, practicing, reflecting, thinking about it, doing self-supervision. Those are all incredibly important. Yeah, it seems like a, a theme throughout is that with these particular skills, that really the personhood of the therapist is really crucial in the absolutely effectiveness of its delivery. Um, absolutely. Yeah. 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 The, the exploration skills in contrast, your focus is completely on the client. You know, you're trying to understand the client. You're trying to figure out how to get the client to explore. And when you shift to these kind of disclosure and immediacy interpretation challenge skills, it's all much more using yourself using your reactions, you know, how did I feel when that happened? And then figuring out how to implement it. Yeah. So it's a lot riskier, yeah. a lot more powerful, but you know, you have to be more careful. Yeah. Yeah. So some therapists err on the side of not doing them and other therapists err on the side of doing them too much, right. but really it's, it's figuring out when it's going to be helpful. And of course we're all going to make mistakes because that's the human yeah. thing. And then figuring out, how to talk to the client about it. I mean, if you were perfect, you'd be a terrible therapist, right? Because the client wants the perfect person. You know, you want somebody you can relate to, who's human, and, you know, is able to admit that they made a mistake and then talk about it and process it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a whole nother training issue of how it's making students comfortable in making mistakes, you know? Right, and that, right. And that's, you know, because they're so like driven for the A, you know, and so it's, it's exactly. You know, that's a it, it, that's always a challenge I find right because yeah you students going for that a they, they get the right answer right. and in therapy there's not a right answer yeah you know there's not a thing okay do one thing I learned early on was do 12 reflections before an interpretation well that's stupid <laughs> you know it does it depends on the client every client's different just as you get used to one client you know, the next client's going to need something else. Yeah, yeah. So learning not only the skills, but when to use them flexibly. Yes. Yeah. An incredible challenge. It's like having different children. They need different things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the way you learn to be a parent is from your children. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. um, so are there any sort of websites, um, additional resources, um, or sort of any other uh you know, resources, websites, readings that you would recommend for either the graduate students or supervisors or educators? Uh, the ones I mentioned already. Yeah. Um, also, APA has, um, I have a couple of videos with APA that are yeah. useful training tools. Yeah, I use those with my students and yeah. they, always, they always give me feedback that it's very helpful. Yeah. APA that yeah. you need. Yeah. Um, we're just going to make another video soon, a meaning in life. So that'll be another helpful one for learning the skills. Um, I can't think, and we're going to be putting together a more sophisticated website to, that'll provide training materials. I'm working with Tim Anderson on that. 
Okay. Um, will, do, you, do you have a sense of when that will be completed? No, <laughs> just starting it. <laughs> All right, well, we'll be looking for it. <laughs> um, so what do you think are some of the most important lessons for psychotherapy instructors or supervisors to take away from your research on um, self-disclosure and immediacy and some of the lessons for students to take away? Yeah, well, I think it's what we've kind of talked about already, the whole notion of as therapists, we need to use ourselves. Mm. You know, we're using our reactions or the, we are the tool, the kind of, uh, we, we're, we're looking for how we react to clients and we're using our reactions in a therapeutic way. So being this carefully attuned tool is just crucial. Um, and so again, personal therapy, training, supervision are all key, but we, we, we're not just robots. You know, uh, we're not going to be ever replaced by robots because it's that human relationship that, that works. And, but it's not just this fuzzy relationship. It's things we do to build the relationship and maintain it. So these skills are, you know, these aren't the only two skills, obviously, that are important. They're, they're all important. Um, but these skills particularly use the therapist and the therapist's reactions. Mm -hmm. So the importance of the therapist being this, this attuned tool where you have to really be aware of your own reactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a big takeaway. This the self-reflection. I yep. guess attunement to oneself and to the other person in the room. Right. Right. Being aware of yourself, being aware of the other person, being able to talk about it, being comfortable with that. And again, that sounds easy, but in fact, it's incredibly difficult, yeah. um, especially to be aware of and admit our own reactions, especially negative reactions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard when you hate a client. It's hard when you're jealous of them. All those things, you know, being with clients in this intimate relationship brings up so many feelings. And even the positive ones are difficult because sometimes we feel too much that way. Yeah. And so it is a constant demand on us as therapists. And we have, to, we have to keep ourselves in tune. Yeah, yeah, good lessons to carry forth. Yep. So I guess speaking of moving forward, what do you think are some of the next steps in terms of, you know, what, what do we do, what do we need to do next um, in terms of the research, um, you know, maybe research on training, uh, just with, with these important skills? Yeah, well, research is absolutely crucial. It's, it's pretty appalling how little research we have on therapist skills because it's very hard to do very time intensive, labor intensive, much easier to throw a bunch of measures at people, but that tells us almost nothing about therapy. Right. Um, and so to get in the nitty gritty of the therapy sessions and look at, I mean, disclosure and immediacy are about the only two skills and, and interpretation that we have almost any data on. Wow. So, I mean, that's, and this is, yeah. You know, 2018, we need, we really need more research. And so I think it's, and with better methods yeah. to really get at this stuff. And, and it's very challenging, but I really, I really encourage people to do this kind of research so that we can have more data. Um, so we teach skills, but we teach them not based on data a lot of times. Um, so empirically supported relationships, well, we need, we need more data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you sort of suggest a mixture of qualitative and quantitative methods or? Absolutely. <laughs> what <I'm> feeling. <laughs> right. So to get into the nitty gritty of what's actually going on. Right. In the process. Right. With the quantitative, you can look at, you can observe sessions and see what happens, but you don't get the inner experience. Yeah. So to go back and ask the therapist and clients, how were you feeling? What was going on? Because we, we learn so early to hide our reactions. Yeah. So you need both kinds of research to get at the full picture. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for Absolutely. joining us. This has been really, I think, helpful uh, for me and for you know educators and students watching this. So just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raina. Take care. Okay.